Welcome to A Voice and Beyond, Brenda Earl Stokes. It's such a pleasure having you. Thank How you are for you having me? Oh, you're so welcome. I've been stalking you on social for some time now, and I thought I have to have this woman on the show. Your marketing is absolutely brilliant. And before we start going into about Brenda and your story in life, how have things been for you in New York during COVID? Well, things obviously were terrible here for a long, long period of time. And where I live in um, New York City, we're right in an area where there are a ton of the major hospitals. So it was pretty, pretty harrowing. I had some incredible photos that I took where I'm standing in the middle of Park Avenue and there are no cars anywhere. I mean, it was mm -hmm. it was wild. Um, but now, you know, since really since the summer, things are pretty much back to normal. Um, we're still masked. Um, there's a very high percentage of people here who have vaccines. Um, and a lot of kids have the vaccines. And so it's really enabled things to open up. Um, and just today, I, as I was telling you before, I took my son to the to see the Nutcracker at the New York City Ballet. And it, you'd feel like it was just a normal day, except we were wearing masks. So yeah did it feel surreal being there did it feel surreal like oh it was after, totally surreal absolutely after, it's been one bit of surreal after another because to, to to be standing on the steps of the metropolitan museum of art and there was nobody there um for months and months and months like there's crowds there all the time like went from nothing and now they're back up to regular attendance it, it's it's been the wildest thing it's really been crazy I have to share with you that I watch Million Dollar Listing New York. It's oh. one. <laughs> okay, I'm a reality TV person. And, and, you know, when you look back at that time and they showed those episodes leading up to the COVID shutting everything down and people were going, oh, yeah, it's going to be over soon. And then seeing New York just no cars on the street nothing it was like a ghost town it was unbelievable it was some it of the was, most it really, unbelievable it was, really, it was a lot it was it was a lot um but you know it things are things are definitely moving along now so that's yeah good. because people kind of think well nothing would ever shut new york down you know nothing's ever going to stop new york from progressing and moving forward and opening up but COVID clearly did it closed everything everywhere. You know, yeah. no one was really exempt yeah. or even in Australia, you know, you mm -hmm. guys had a lot of issues too. So we did, we did, know, but it's, we're moving, moving along now, which is good. So good. Now, Brenda, you are an accomplished pianist, vocalist. You've had a massive career as a performer, as a recording artist, composer, and educator. We're going to go into all of those things because I always love to learn about my guests and what has influenced them and how they've come to the point of time they're at right now. And you started your musical journey at four and that was playing the piano or was it singing? What came first? It was piano, very much piano. I took classical piano lessons from the age of four, you know, just the usual thing that middle-class people send, sign their kids up, you know, um, nothing terribly competitive, but both of my parents had played piano when they were children, um, growing up. And my mother even played organ when she was in nursing school, she played for church services. And so I think it was just the, the, the assumption was that we would just, it would be one of the things that we did. And so that's what we did. Yeah, I must admit, I did piano when I was little and I was learning from the nuns at school. And if we got something wrong, they would hit us over the, the knuckles with yeah, the ruler. That was, that was not my experience. <laughs> so <laughs> clearly, I stopped piano lessons. I didn't progress with them. Now, at age 15, you heard the music of Oscar Peterson, I believe. Yes. And it was a total game changer. So I, I started playing clarinet when I was in about fourth grade, when I was about nine years old. And then through high school, you know, when, when you play piano, that's a solitary project. 
And so I started playing clarinet in the, in the jazz band. And then they told us that we couldn't keep playing clarinet in the jazz band because there technically weren't any clarinets in the actual music. Yes. And I was so, I was so upset and I, you know, I had heard Oscar Peterson and I went, this is what I want to do. I'm, I'm absolutely desperate to do this. And there was already a girl who was playing piano in the jazz band and she finally like saw how desperate I was to be in it. And she said, you obviously need this more than I do. (laughs) So she stepped down from the jazz band so that I could be in it because she could see I was absolutely desperate to be in it. And so it was like, that was it for me. I was like, this is, this was the right, the right thing. My, the issue for me with classical playing is that I really wanted to like color outside the lines a lot Mm. and there just wasn't a place for that. And so when I heard what Oscar was doing, I went, that's, that's the thing I've been looking to do. So it it was really a life altering thing. As I'm sitting here talking to you, I am looking at a huge framed picture and signed photo um, of Oscar Peterson. It's always right here in front of me at all the time. Wow. So you have your inspiration in front of you. Absolutely. When you were telling us the story about the other girl playing in the jazz band, I mm-hmm. just had this image of you hovering around this poor <laughs> girl, like totally stalking her. It's like, <laughs> get off that piano stool. <laughs> I wasn't mean or anything. I wasn't no. vibing her, but I was definitely like, you know, like just outside, like going, can I have a turn? I really want to play. And and she was nice. She was like, just take it, just do it. It's mean just do it. <laughs> I can't <laughs> deal with you any longer. <laughs> Okay. And then you went into formal training for piano as well. Yeah. So I, you know, I had taken all those classical piano lessons and then, um, my high school band director was a, was a pretty accomplished jazz saxophone player. And so he said, well, I took a couple of semesters of, of jazz piano, you know, the mandatory required jazz piano classes. And he said, so I started going to his house on Saturdays, um, and taking lessons with him. And he taught me everything he knew about jazz piano in, you wow. know, in a couple of months. And then he said, I don't, I can't teach you anymore. And so I started driving. I'm from um, Southwestern Ontario in Canada. And I started driving on the weekends an hour away or an hour and a half to London, Ontario, um, where there was a professional jazz piano teacher there who people had recommended. And then after I studied with him for a while, um, I started to take the four hour train to Toronto to take lessons with, um, a jazz pianist named Mark Eisenman, who ended up being, you know, a pretty integral part of my, um, my musical journey. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really committed to it. And there was a lot of information that I wanted to know, and I just kept going to seek it, you know? Yes. And when did you start, um, studying at York university? So when I graduated from high school, when I was, you know, 17, I immediately went to York and, and went for jazz piano. And the teacher, I, Mark Eisenman, who I was studying with in Toronto, was on faculty there. And so I did get to spend a lot of time with him, which was, was, was really great. And, and now when I look back at that time, it really was the most incredible program. And I got so much out of it. And there were so many wonderful musicians that were there at that time. So it was just a real place of incubation of ideas and learning. And we spent a lot of time in the pub together, like drinking pitchers of beer and um, me grilling the bass player in the band. Like what, what, what are the chord changes in the bridge? Like really, really deep into that. And of course, at that time, Oscar Peterson was the chancellor of the university. Really? So I, we got to spend time with him. He wow. Out with us a couple of times each semester and he came to our concerts. So there was a time where he came and was doing a a workshop and I was the piano player in the group. And at one point he came and sat down on the piano bench next to me and we played together. (laughs) I I bet you. you It was the craziest thing. It was the craziest thing. Yeah, yeah. And he's he's been living, he he had at that point had been living in um, very near the university in Toronto um, for many, many years. And, you know, he would just come and hang out and he was such a generous person. And, and it was really a great, you know, to meet your hero can be a mixed bag because your hero could be a huge jerk, right? Yes. But he was so gentle and so kind and so generous. And he was just, he was just the epitome of, of all the magic things. He was, he was amazing. Wow. So you let him sit on the piano stool next to you, unlike that other girl at high school. Yeah. <laughs> 
was a very different thing. I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. He's like, hang on, I want to show you something. And he like, he came over and, and he, he, like, he said, scooch over a bit. And, and we sat on the piano bench together and we played, you know, played a standard and he showed me some beautiful things and said some things to me that I still talk about to my students today, you know, all these years later. That is a true inspiration when you can hold those those ideas and those pearls of wisdom so close to your heart that that's really incredible. Okay, so up to this point, had you done any singing? So I had done some singing, you know, I sang in the church choir a little bit. I used to sing Oh Holy Night on Christmas Eve just because they were nice and they asked me to do it. Um, <laughs> I, I had sung in my school's concert choir, which was tiny and was not like a huge group of people. And, um, at I, then I was the accompanist of the choir and then they, they kind of cut some funding for our school. And so the vocal music teacher had to leave. And so mm -hmm. the, the high school band director said, we need someone to conduct the choir. Will you conduct the choir? <laughs> and so oh. I was conducting the choir when I was like 16, I knew nothing about what I was doing, but it was, it was a great experience. But when I got to York, I really turned the singing thing off because at that time it was the, you know, the mid nineties and Diana crawl was the big brouhaha. And so everywhere I went, people were like, Oh, you're just like Diana crawl. You're just like a singer who plays a little bit of piano. And I really wanted to be taken seriously as a pianist. Mm -hmm. I didn't want anyone to say, Oh, you're just the singer that plays. I, I just, it, it really irritated me a lot. And there was yeah. also a lot of, um, there was a lot of sexism still is in the jazz industry. And I was sick of people kind of treating me like I wasn't. So I decided right off the bat that I was going to be taken seriously and I was not going to, to, to sing. However, I was singing in private and I, I always tell the story. I was the music librarian for the jazz program. And I had this like huge kind of walk-in closet with a record player and all these books of transcriptions. And I would go in there and put records on the record player and I would sing along with Carmen McRae. And I was literally like, I joke, I was a closeted singer because I was literally in a closet, in a closet. <laughs> singing. And one night, I mean, this is after hours. One Must night, have been a big closet. It was like a, it was a, <laughs> like a walk-in closet, but I mean, it, you know, and I was in there and I'm singing and I'm, you know, I'm yeah. just going to town on Carmen McRae. And all of a sudden there's a knock at the door. And I went, oh no. And I, I opened the door and it was one of my friends who was a, a jazz saxophone player. And he's like, hi, who's, who's singing in there? And I'm like, nobody. And he's like, are you singing in there? <laughs> it was like the weirdest thing. I felt like I'd been caught. And so I, I didn't, I didn't sing a note in front of anybody the whole time I was there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the summer after I graduated, I went to the BAMP center for fine arts for, they had this incredible, um, three week jazz intensive. And while I was there, somebody said, you know, I heard you singing in a closet. <laughs> like somebody else heard me singing and said, you know, have you ever thought about doing it? And so I just stood up and sang one song and I, it felt so right to me and I got great feedback and it just felt, I felt like, oh yeah, maybe this is what I can do. So when I got back to Toronto, I started my first trio and I sang and played piano. Wow. So lucky you had a big closet. It was a big closet. Yeah. <laughs> unlike the, my studio space here in New York City, like similar size. Yes, yes. Uh, now you have had a massive performance career. So you have performed across the US, Canada, New Zealand and Australia. You've played at venues such as the Kennedy Centre, Carnegie Hall, the Toronto Jazz Festival, just to mention a few amazing venues. But when I was doing my background stalk on you, I discovered a little piece of information that I went, yes. And that was that you performed with Duran Duran. Now I have to tell you, I loved the eighties. I actually thought I, I was the eighties. I was happening <laughs> in the eighties. I love that music still do. And Duran Duran was one of my favorite bands. So how was that experience and how did that come about? Well, I, I didn't play with them. We opened for them. Well, I don't, so, well, still, 
Well, it was, it was very cool. I was, I started playing with this, um, kind of breakthrough act in Toronto, this guy called Johnny favorite. And he had, it was sort of the time that the big swing thing was kicking up in the nineties mm -hmm. and he was, had kind of ridden the wave of that and then had produced an, an album with a pretty major label. Um, and I guess they were floating people around to open for Duran Duran at the Molson amphitheater, which is a huge, I don't know, 10,000, 15,000 seat amphitheater outside. Ooh. And we ended up there and it was again, a totally bizarre thing because, you know, like, who am I, <laughs> you know, I, and you know, to be, the syndrome. it was, well, I mean, I just, it's just like, yeah. what, what am I doing? Yeah. Here? It, was, yes. it was very, you know, and it was fun to play and I got to meet the guys in the band and it was a totally different scene than I'd ever been used to. Cause I really mm -hmm. had only done really jazz or classical music at that point. So I was used to a very different venue, but it was super fun and great. And, um, I was asked to tour with the, with, with the same band that I put, I opened for, for Duran Duran with, but at that point I was leaving Toronto. So I mm. was like, okay, I'm, I'm going. So I'm like out of here decision. Yeah. I was, I was like ready to take a, take a change, you know? Yes. You know, Duran Duran was on morning TV here on a breakfast show a few weeks ago and they're making a comeback. Oh, t I, it doesn't surprise me at all. A lot of those, the eighties groups and a lot of nineties groups are coming back. There's sort of that opening for it again, you know? Yes. Yes. Spandau ballet is another one that's kept going, but I love all that music. Absolutely mm -hmm. love it. And I'm very jealous that you <laughs> opened for them. So how did you make your transition from the studio then into the professional world? Because there's a lot of people that don't know where to start. How did it happen for you? Well, I, I started playing for money when I was in high school because I, I had been a ballet dancer all from the time I was uh, young and I, I mean, not, not a, not a terribly good one, not a terribly great ballet dancer, but I, I was dancing three or three times a week, you know, mm -hmm. through high school. And then at some point, you know, they needed an accompanist and it seemed like an opportunity. And so I started making $5 an hour accompanying little kids ballet classes. And so when I got into university, I had that experience, even though it was a very small time kind of experience, but people started recommending me for some interesting things. So that the head of the jazz program at York, um, heard that they needed a pianist and a composer to write. They were doing like a Rocky horror picture show of Aeschylus's Agamemnon, you know, the Greek play. And they had <laughs> this director like a lot. From, they had this South African director from Cape town who was coming and they were, you know, and so I, I was like, I would love to do something like that, you know, because they, I, I just seemed like I was into doing things. And then I started accompanying um, ballet classes at the university I was at. And so when, when I was zeroing in on it's time to graduate, I realized that I was going to have to figure something out. And I, mm -hmm. about four months before I graduated, this is again in the nineties, I got the phone book out. I made a list of all of the ballet studios in Toronto and I sent all of them my resume and business card and cover letter, just mailed them all out. And I had three job offers right away, like to start whenever I graduated. And so for me, the way that I started was by, by saying, what is something that I can do now that I could probably, I'm, that I'm good enough at that mm -hmm. I can be successful at it. Yes. And, and so, so, cause if I had tried to get a big teaching job, it wouldn't have worked. And I knew that. I was not at a place where I was going to be playing gigs that were going to pay much more than $50. Yes. So I, I, I thought a little bit, you know, this kind of goes back to, you know, planning and thinking through is like, well, I know that there are a ton of ballet schools and I know that they all work in the after school hours. And so that was a great place to start. And then I had as much work as I wanted. I, I worked between 20 and 30 hours a week. Um, you know, I was making, I mean, amazing. If, if I was making enough to pay my own rent, all of my own bills and everything and have a little bit money left over. And I had my own apartment. I wasn't living with 10 roommates. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really like, it was the mother of necessity. It was like sort of the mother of invention, you know, as I mm -hmm. had to figure it out. Yes. I'm not surprised at all though, because you are very entrepreneurial and we will I, get to that. Yeah. yeah it's funny because are. I, I just, it, it, I didn't, I don't think I thought of, I was thinking of it that way. I just no. was like, I have to figure something out because I am mm -hmm. not moving back into my dad's house in Sarnia. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
I know, like I, I consider myself to be entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. But when I started, I didn't think of myself as that way either. But then when you start to look back and reflect on your, your career, a lot of it is being entrepreneurial. It doesn't yeah. matter how good you are. No one's going to come knocking on your door unless you put right. yourself out there. So yeah, and at it, that time, mm. I knew uh, so many of my friends were teaching little kids piano. And I knew for a fact, I did not want to do that, that I, I wanted to do something where I could be playing the piano all day. And in the ballet classes, you're playing the entire time and you're playing a ton of different music and you're improvising and you're going through a lot of rap. So I was like, this is perfect because they're paying me to play the piano all day. So that yeah. was a big win. Yeah. Beautiful. Then you headed to the cruise ships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what cruise ship company were you working for? I did one contract with Norwegian Cruise Lines yeah. and then mm -hmm. I did six contracts for Royal Caribbean. Mm hmm. Wow. And it was sort of a, sort of a similar thing. There were a whole lot of things happening. Um, it was, it was, I think it was the year, it was the year 2000 and I'd been, I'd been graduated for a couple of years and, you know, my ballet accompanying work had really been picking up and I started getting called by like some ballet companies to do things. And, you know, I, I had been doing a bunch of gigs around, but if things were feeling a little stagnant and I kind mm -hmm. of felt like if I don't get out of here, I don't think I'll ever get out of here. Mm -hmm. You know, and so again, thinking of like, well, what could I do? And a lot of my friends played in the show band, you know, playing in the band that does the, does the stage shows yes. and plays for the yes. Dixieland set and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, they were making like $400 a week or something. And I thought, well, I sing and I play piano. I wonder if I could do sing along piano bar. And somebody was telling me, yeah, they play like pay like double what you make in the show band yes. and you yes. get your own cabin and you have yes. passenger status. And I'm like, I want that. So just as I did with the ballet school, I looked up all the cruise lines and sent out my stuff. I recorded a little CD of me mm -hmm. and I got headshots done yes. and, um, they all rejected me except for Norwegian. And the booking agent said, you know, do you know a lot of songs? And I'm like, I know tons of songs. I could do this all day. And they're like, okay, you're hired. You leave in like three weeks. And I was like, oh my God, mm. well, I got on the cruise ship and I knew a ton of songs, but they were all jazz songs. You didn't and tell you, them that. Well, I mean, they didn't ask, but well, that's yeah, technically not lying. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I got the gig, you know, I got yes. it. And I realized that if I was going to last, I was going to have to figure it out. And this is my thing. I'm it's all about figuring it out. I'm going to figure it out. I hear you. I hear you. So I, I, I brought a couple of fake books with me and I brought an enormous book of CDs. Like I burned CDs. I had tons and tons of CDs. My father cleared out his whole, whole collection of CDs. And we've had these two huge books, you know, those big books where you put the CDs in them. And I just hunkered down and somebody would say, would make requests. I would write their requests down. I would say, come back tomorrow night. I'm going to play that for you. And I would sit in my Good bed. Move. I that would sit in my bed. Good move. See, entrepreneurial. I'll come come back tomorrow night. I got yeah. it. Yeah, come I back come tomorrow night. night. <laughs> and I got it. And so I would sit in my bed because I didn't have a keyboard in my room. My room was tiny. Yes. Um, and I would sit in my bed. I had a pitch pipe so I could guess what key I was in. And then I would use like, I would, uh -huh, I would try to guess what the chords were. I would write down by hand the lyrics. Because that's what I we used to do. We no, but that's what we access. used to do back I wrote in the them day. All down. I yeah. had notebook after notebook. I learned in 11 weeks, I learned over 700 songs. My goodness. And wow. most of them by the end of it were memorized because I was playing like four or five or six hours a night. And so I was playing them on rotation. If no one was in the lounge, I'd practice. So it, it was a really incredible experience for me. And then when I switched over to Royal Caribbean and I really knew what I was doing, then I could really start to invest in like getting to know people and getting a sense of if, if people came in, I could guess kind of their age group and know that these mm -hmm. people are going to like Carol King mm -hmm. or these people are going to want a Backstreet Boys song or mm -hmm. someone would come in and I'd hear them speaking Italian and I would sing like Buenos Aires or something like that, or they'd be speaking French. So I started to really tune into like, how do you connect with an audience and, and how do you like, how do you how do you make people have a really, really good time? Yes. Know? Yes. In other words, how do you entertain? And as singers, that is our job to entertain. Yeah. 
That is what we're paid to do. And a lot of that learning comes on the, happens on the job. Absolutely. And you I was can't there learn night that after night, any night other after way. Night after mm-hmm. night, and I had to connect and I had bar staff that were running around and connecting with them and having yes. inside jokes and having them dance around. It was, it was like the whole, the whole experience. And as someone who was really, you know, the ultimate sort of jazz snob before I got into it, it gave me a very different appreciation. I mean, jazz musicians can, can be, you know, Miles Davis famous, famously would face his back to the audience, you know, because it's How like, okay. rude. <laughs> but, um, but you know, it, it was, it was a great learning experience for me to start to discover my strength. And I feel like it was there where I really became a singer because I was singing mm-hmm. all the time and had to really figure out like, what is that? What does that even look like? Yeah. A couple of questions. Yes. Firstly, though, I do have to ask this question before we get serious. What was the song that was the most requested? Piano Man. You know what? I had that written down. Piano Man. I had Piano Man. The other one, American Pie. I did American Pie a lot. Um, the, some of the Jimmy Buffett songs, which I absolutely makes my skin crawl. I hate it so much. Um, you know, Margaritaville was like a very big one. American Pie a bit. I used to do a spoof on American Pie where I would sing because you know it's like seven minutes long. Yes. I would do the two minute version of it. Yes. Madonna released would... a version that was actually pretty cool. Oh, was it? I yeah, I, just... I used to sing that one. Um, so I would sing the I would sing the verses at warp speed, almost like an auctioneer. And then when it came to the sing-along part, I'd slow down so we could all sing together. And then I'd sw- like swoop through. So that was kind of how I, I got through it. But yeah, Piano Man, I played thousands of times. I always yes. joke that when I went to graduate school, I was on the Billy Joel scholarship program. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So how did you sustain working all those hours, all those nights a week as a solo vocalist? Well, I was, first of all, I was 23. So that was half of it because you just get, you can get away with murder. Um, I was very, very careful with, I, I had an exercise routine that I did every day. So, um, I tried not to drink alcohol if I was singing the next night. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't always maintain that. Cause again, I was 23, no. but and you are I on would, a cruise ship. Yeah. And it, yes. we had dollar beers in the crew mass. It was just, it was yes. the whole thing, but you know, I was, I, I had about an hour um, exercise routine. And then I would go in the steam room for, you know, 20 minutes. And then I would do half a warm up and have my dinner and bring my tea back to my cabin. And I would do the other half of my warm up. Um, and then I would go up and sing. And, and so I, I had a very good, it, it was, it was in some ways sort of the easiest time of my life because I was playing five hours a night, some nights, but I was doing nothing else the rest of the day. <laughs> You know, I was like laying by the pool and reading a book or we were in port and I was, you know, in Mexico wandering around like eating tacos or something. So it was yes. it, in some ways it was it was an easy way to do it. But, you yes. know, I, I definitely got into some vocal trouble a couple of times, but I, I negotiated through it. It's it's interesting. The reason why I asked what cruise ship companies you worked for is because I know there are some that treat their entertainers better than others and I know Royal very well because my daughter works for Celebrity Cruise Lines Mm -hmm. which is the sister company to Royal in fact I think Royal now owns Celebrity yeah Mm. yeah and their entertainers don't have any extra onboard duties but I had a student that was working for another company which I'm not going to name and she came back broken after her contract because she was performing at nighttime and during the day she was on child minding duties and oh, she yeah, was no. she yeah. was like using her voice a lot and having to speak really loudly to a lot of children during the day and she came back and she was really messed up so your so these experiences that we have on cruise ships can be either positive or negative one based on the company that you work for the other also what you said that was um, fantastic was that you took care of yourself and a lot of singers run into problems on those ships because there is so much social activity going on 
So you finish your gig, you then have to, if you're in the production shows, there's meet and greet. So you're talking to guests in between and after shows and you actually never, and, and then they all go down to the crew mess and mm -hmm. there's all the drinking and all the more talking and it's not, it can be a very unhealthy lifestyle, but sounds like you were very clever and very intuitive and it ended up being positive for you. It was. And, and I think the biggest thing was, I mean, my first contract, I didn't really know what I was doing. Like I had a picture of New York city, like a postcard from New York city that I had hanging on my mirror. And I didn't quite know what it was doing there. But when I, by the time I finished my first contract, I, I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, take all this money and I'm going to go move to New York for six months. And I'm going to take all the lessons and hear all the, so I really had my eyes on a bigger thing. Yes. So as after the Amazing. first one, especially I really had my eyes on the next thing I was going to do. So it was, it was easier to be focused. Yes. So, okay. So what happened from there? What, what happened career wise from there? So I, you know, I came back to Toronto. I recorded, I guess that was my first full length album kind of by accident. I sort of forgot about it. And then I went on, a, then I auditioned for Manhattan school of music. Um, or no, then I moved to New York city and I spent six months here and where I live now, um, and took every lesson I ever wanted to take, heard every group went out every night to hear music, um, practice like eight hours a day learned a million songs, like did all of the oh my things. Gosh. And then by the time the six months were rolling, you know, we're running out and the money was like dangerously low. And I was going set scheduled to go back to a cruise ship. My voice teacher, my piano teacher, who both taught at Manhattan school of music said, well, like, have you thought about coming to MSM to do your master's degree? And they, it was, it was sort of the perfect thing because it gave me something that I could legitimately be doing so that I would meet people easier and kind of be involved in something. And it also, it, it, it solved the immigration issue because mm -hmm. Canadians can't, you can't just move to the U S like you have to have. So it, it bought me some time. So, you know, I auditioned, I got in, um, and I did a few more cruise ship gigs back to back to pay for it. And then in September, 2002, I moved to New York which turned out to be permanent because I'm still here. <laughs> you are, you never went back home. I mean, You're I've been still home there. to visit, no, but I've, but... <laughs> been, I've been here, I've been living here for, it's almost 20 years. So, so yeah. Let's talk about your original music because you have released six albums from yeah. what I understand, what I know. You have your own music label. When did you start recording and it was it all original music and was it jazz so sorry lots of questions yeah there. no so the first time i re i recorded a five song ep right around the time that i graduated from my undergrad because we were all supposed to do a recording project and i decided i was going to like really take it seriously and it was a combination of a couple of original songs and then a couple of like my deeply arranged covers of other people's songs and like a standard um, so that was my official first release that I did when I was still in Toronto, but I did an album of, um, some vocal, some instrumental music was the first one I did. And I don't know when that was 2002. And again, kind of forgot about it until I came back from the cruise ship gig and the, the producer called me and said, like, are you going to do anything with this? And I was like, oh yeah, I should do something with that. So, you know, I've, I've written, I have a very wide range of things that I'm interested in. And I would say that the cruise ship was also a real tipping point for the songwriting process, because I always considered songs to be 32 bar standards mm -hmm. or to be original compositions like Kenny, Kenny Wheeler songs or songs by Miles Davis or Wayne Shorter or something. And so the pop doing all the pop music really influenced me into that harmony and I, I started doing a lot of um, like sort of contemporary jazz arrangements of pop songs and my writing kind of expanded out of that. Um, so Very cool. There's, there's sort of a flavor of Brazilian music in it. There's wow. some stuff that's more jazz influenced. And then there is some definitely like from a lyric point of view, from a melodic point of view is there's definitely a, a pop influence there. Yes. And okay. So what about the lyrics? Uh, are you like an Adele so we can listen to your music and we can learn everything about you through your music? What inspires you when you're writing? 
mean, it depends on what I'm doing. I, I feel like Adele is, it's pretty, it's like really in your face. I think I'm a little more nuanced about, about it. And, you know, I, I did an album called um, Songs for a New Day where yes, I- Yes, 2009. I Yes. I, I was going to say, I don't know when it was, but um, I know <laughs> and, and it, was, it was from a time in my period where or a period in my life where things were really changing for me in a very, very, very profound way. And I had written a lot of stuff during that period of time that were all leaning kind of in that direction. And so it's about half original music and some, some covers and a couple of other things, a couple of standards, but all of it, I felt like we're, we're, we're painting a picture of where I was kind of living at that time, but are also not so specific that other people can't relate to it. Right. You know? Yes. So I, I, I have a new project that I, I, I was on an artist residency back in, in November of 2019. I, I was planning to record the album in 2020, but you know how that ended, mm -hmm. um, but it's called the motherhood project. And it's a collection of songs about the experience of like contemporary motherhood. And so there's, there's sort of some of the, there, look at my beautiful baby. What a wonderful thing. Like, you know, everybody oh, writes that song. Yes. But then there's also a lot of songs about, you know, identity and what it means when you're getting lost in your identity or mm -hmm. the, the rage of that, you know, I read that, yes. that book fed up, you know, where the emotional burden on mothers and the judgment and, mm. um, body image issues. So there it's a, it's a wide range of, of subjects, um, about that. And I would say that was, it's probably the biggest amount of writing that I've, I've done. I wrote 10 songs in nine days <gasps> and, um, it's like almost, Goodness, almost completely finished all this music. I just have to, at some point, <laughs> figure out when I'm going to record it. Yes. And I bet you would be a best-selling album because everything that you just spoke about in terms of motherhood, every mother on this planet will absolutely relate to it. And especially young mothers, when you talked about judgment, because I think that's one of the biggest issues new mothers experience these days is that judgment and oh, absolutely you know and we have social media and google to thank for that because in yeah. my day we didn't have books you know i was 20 when just turned 21 when i had my first child and i'd never been around a baby and my yeah. child my child survived and has ended up being a, a beautiful person so we can do it without all that judgment and without absolutely. everyone's input uh absolutely. and all the shaming yeah yeah and there was another album that that i wanted to ask you about and there was a solo session that you oh yeah did. that's the i released that one in 2019 i went i went home to, to i was getting ready to go back to sarnia and out of the blue um an old friend of mine from high school reached out to me and said like you know the public library they had like a concert space with this beautiful steinway he says i've been doing some recording there the piano is in really good shape. They just did some, they did some renovation on, on it. The, the space is really great. And I've been recording there. Like if you're ever in town, would you like to record? And I'm like, well, I'm going to be in town in like three weeks. Mm. And we did, we recorded the entire album in four hours, completely what? live off the floor, no edits, no nothing. Like I came oh. in and did two takes of everything. Oh my and, gosh. And it was something that I'd been wanting to do. Cause obviously I have done a lot of solo. I mean, all the cruise ship stuff and all the gigs I've done. And I play at home all by myself all the time. And I had never recorded a solo thing before. So, you know, we just did it and I released it and I, you know, per, you know, the whole wazoo and, you know, it got a review in downbeat magazine. I was like completely gobsmacked by it. Um, did you feel vulnerable uh, recording in that way without the band and without all the bells and whistles, or did it feel like a really natural was, thing? I was, I was home. I was literally in my hometown where I spent my, you know, half of my life on the piano where I had done all of my piano recitals, all of my piano exams. Like I did my ballet recitals at this place. It was like, I couldn't have been, I, I knew the place like the back of my hand. So, and I was with an old high school friend and everyone had Canadian accents. Even the piano tuner came and I was like, oh my God, I know this is Brandon. Like we know each other. So it, it, it was from that point of view, it was, it was great. And since I didn't put a lot of pressure, I, I had three weeks to prepare. I picked some songs, I put it together and I did it. So it felt like a lot lower Hold stress, on. you know? Hold on. Can you hear this? 
they're doing oh, it. Oh, is that your answer um, machine? No, it's an emergency okay. test. Can you believe? Oh, no. Just hold on. <laughs> we'll have to. Can you believe worry, it? Can you hear right. this? Oh yeah, hear I can hear it. it. Yeah, it's just saying it's a it's just a check. Can you believe that? <laughs> okay. Let's go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so let's go into your teaching now. Did you plan to teach or did it happen to like most of us fell into teaching serendipitous I can't even say the word ha huh. most of us <laughs> most of us fell into teaching it wasn't something that we actually planned did that happen to you with both the piano teaching and the voice teaching yeah so when I you know, I went, I went right from ballet accompaniment in Toronto. I did not teach at anyone. I think I maybe taught like one or two people who asked, but when I moved to New York, again, it was sort of a sustainability thing of, I've got to figure it out because I need to stay here. Cause I, you know, I, I have to learn how to stay here. And so there were a lot of positions for, you know, teaching artists, like an in inner city school, there were these like foundations where they bring. And so I got placed in a couple of elementary schools, like in central Harlem and in, um, uh, middle school in, um, the Bronx. And I was like teaching kids and I was using some of the stuff that I had learned from, um, you know, different, like accompanying things I'd done. And I, mm -hmm. I had so much fun doing it. Um, and then right around the time that I was graduating from Manhattan school with my master's degree, they asked me if, if I wanted to teach at this summer music festival. And I ended up teaching there for eight summers and it was six weeks. And I was teach I was teaching voice and piano. I was the only person wow. teaching two instruments. And at that point I had studied some, you know, I had had some voice training and, and I, I had kind of a, and I was running, I was teaching the jazz choir at this camp. And I really learned, especially over the first couple of summers, I really learned how to do it. Mm -hmm. I was teaching, I was teaching like 40 or 45 hours a week of voice lessons while I was there. I was running a jazz combo. I was running the jazz. I was teaching like 10 hours a day. It was crazy. And what I was able to do in a very low key way was to figure out, first of all, that I really enjoyed doing it and that I had a kind of a natural talent for speaking to people and for figuring things out. Um, and I, I really started to love it. And I, I started to kind of build my studio after that. So did you go and have any more formal pedagogy uh, training? from that yeah I, I started I, I started spending a lot of time um doing somatic voice work um I was really really busy in that world so I took like level one and then one summer I went and did level two and level three and I, I took a ton of ton of voice lessons and went to like teacher support groups and and started to get a lot more active in the voice community because again mm -hmm. I was I was I was curious about it I wanted to be a better teacher and then again I realized that I went into it and had a knack so I've taught I've taught somatic voice work a bunch of times I, I've taught it in Australia we, we came into Toowoomba at USQ yes um, and you know taught it a couple of times and and I, I also taught my own course there one summer so you know I've I've definitely I, I've studied classical choral conducting I've done Kodai stuff I I'm, I'm somebody that likes to go out and find some stuff and get into stuff for a couple of years and then it mm -hmm. informs the rest of what I do. Yes. Now talking about informing, because you had that extensive performance career, does that influence your voice teaching or let's say even your piano teaching in any way? Yeah, it informs it in, in every way. And, and it's, it's funny because the more time that I've actually sat and thought, because a lot of what I'm trying to do is figure out how can I get someone to point from point A to point B in the most mm -hmm. efficient way possible? Yes. Because like, it's one thing to say, oh, you've got to hit every stop along the way, but I didn't hit every stop along the way. I skipped a lot of steps and I went back and filled a bunch of holes up as I went. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I've always really been about like, how can I break this down in a way to decide what is really necessary and what isn't necessary and what things are worth spending some time on, um, you know, fr from a foundational point of view and what are some things that, um, we can kind of skip over because they're not going to affect. So, especially because I work with so many, you know, uh, people always send me the students who are like, I don't know what to do with this person. <laughs> I'm the person they're like, send it to Brenda, send her to Brenda, you know? 
And, and so a lot of times I can, I can listen to somebody and really kind of get a sense for what, it, who are they, what are they trying to do? And then I can kind of stop and say, well, what, what would they actually need to know for this? And what are some things that I would like for them to know? Mm. So that's, that's really helped a lot. It's, it's also helped to that. I can avoid some of the toxic stuff that can happen in lessons when you feel yes. like threatened by your students or, you know, all that stuff where people have big opinions and they don't want their students doing this or that, because I, I don't feel that way. Like when someone comes in, I really want to see them succeed and I want them to do better mm-hmm. than I've ever done before. And because I feel confidence insecure with my own career and it's still going yes. on. Yes. So I, I feel like some of that petty stuff that we all know shows up in lessons sometimes with some people, um, that we don't, that I don't have to succumb to that. And I can skip all that stuff and just, we can make music together. Yes. And also I don't, I know that, uh, my performance background absolutely informs the way that I teach. And also to, it's not only skipping over the petty stuff, but in order to make our students employable, it's knowing what they need to know. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and and, and, have, and also ha- having been in a lot of different a lot of different industries, because as I said, I, I I was a classical conductor for a couple of years, like at a university, I was conducting their women's ensemble, and you know I've done a lot of different things, and so a lot of times someone will come in. And I also know a million songs and have sung a million songs. So a lot of times someone will come in, they're a songwriter and they're doing something. And I'm like, you know what you need to listen to? (laughs) And I go through the card catalog of the million songs I know. And I'm like, you really need to be listening to blah or that's what I do. Yeah. Here's the kind of thing. Like if you like Billie Eilish, then you will love Tori Amos. You know, it's that kind of, yes, I do that. Yeah. And, and, and hearing really a certain a sound. Yeah. Sorry. And hearing a certain sound in someone's voice and you go, wow, you need to l- listen to this artist and really having a good grip of all the repertoire. Yes. That makes a huge difference. Mm. And also because I've done a lot of different gigs and I've worked as a side person with a lot of people, I can say to somebody, when you do X, it's going to really be problematic for the people in your band. So let me help you to fix X. X is always rhythm. Let's just be clear. It's always rhythm. It's rhythm. Um, Whenever you're having that issue, it's like, I'm going to troubleshoot this because not only have I been on the front side of the band, I'm often in the back. So I, I can tell you what you need to be doing up there so that you can mesh with what we're doing back here. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely going to help that. Yes. And also talking about that it's all the performance demands isn't it mm-hmm. unless you've lived that life and you've walked the walk and talked the talk it's very hard to guide students in terms of what they're going to experience on stage exactly. touring yeah. on a cruise ship etc do you believe now this may be a very controversial question and your opinion is valid here because it's your opinion mm-hmm. do you believe that in higher education that the voice training programs are serving our students adequately at the present no. time no i don't i do and not. why is that and i can't say all of them are not because there mm-hmm. are i can name a several programs that i think mm-hmm. are really nailing it mm-hmm. but where i see a lot of issues with what comes down the pike is that there's still some of the old guard system that is in place And I think at this point, unless you are an organist, you do not need to be learning figured base. You know, there's, there is all of this emphasis on, you know, you have to do a classical song in order to get into the contemporary music theater program, or you have to play a classical piece on piano to get into the jazz program. It's like wanting to have it both ways. Either you're a conservatory that is training artists or you're a university who has to cover certain things. And so that's where I I start to take issues. I also, and again, I can't speak to other places other than, you know, what I know in the United States and Canada, but there is a real dumbing down of things for singers, which I take personal issue with that. The singers are in a separate theory class, that the singers are in their own improv class in the jazz program, that the singers are learning piano skills that are not useful for them. And so what I really see as being a crucial thing is how well is the, the program 
equipping the students to be able to walk out the door and actually be able to function in some capacity and get a and job means, right in in something and it doesn't even because yes. remember my first job i was accompanying little kids ballet classes it's something i i had something to do but if all you can do is sing the 10 songs that you sang at your um recital and you can't play any piano and you can't conduct anything and you can't sing in a choir and you can't, you know, you can barely read music because your, your music theory class was, was counterpoint, you know, and you can't read chords on the piano. I take issue with that because then you've spent all this money, which over here is a lot of money. It is. <laughs> it's expensive in Australia. It is. it is criminally insane in this country. What stuff costs. It, yes, it is. It's not like, as expensive. We're talking yeah. like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes. $200,000 to get an yes. undergraduate us dollars. And, you know, and I, I take a real issue with that and, and I've seen how it's failed so many people. And I, so, so that's really what my concern is, is, is being able to train people in a way where they're learning all of the things that are useful for them to know, to have those conversations, to learn that repertoire, to, to dig into theory in a real way, but then to also walk out with a functional amount of skills that are, that make sense for what you are doing. And so there's no reason that you're being forced to sing in a second language if you're a jazz singer, you know, yes. there, you know, there's no reason to be singing arias if you're not, if that's not, unless you're interested in doing that. So mm -hmm. anyways, I could go on about it all day. No, no, no. That, I, I am, yes. I am troubled about it. And, and another yes. thing that I, I think about it too, I, I think of, cause you know, this is the segue into what I do, which is I yes. spend a lot of time teaching singers how to play piano. I consider this to be a feminist issue because so the huge majority, especially in jazz programs of the women in the program are singers. And so when the singers are walking around and they can't play piano and they don't know how to count in the band and, and no one has taught them to do those things or their classes are being taught by a male faculty member who knows nothing about singing. I really look at that as a, as an issue of like gender equality, because if the, if the singers, if the women singers or the singers in general aren't being taught those skills, then they're always going to be ridiculed and they're never going to feel like they're part of the group. Mm. And so I take issue with that big time. Yes. I, I know in Australia that uh, as, a, as a female and I fronted a band, numerous bands over the years, we, we're referred to as the chick singers. And there's mm -hmm. always so many jokes about you know, how can you tell there's a chick singer at the door? And, you know, so many jokes about, uh, we're, we're made a mockery of, and there is definitely a gender bias in, in our industry. As, you, as uh, the news has, has now come out that it's really across all industries and it's mm -hmm. only people are starting, women are starting to speak up now. Absolutely. So we are going to segue into your online teaching program. And this is how I learned about you is through social media and you do an amazing job of marketing. You truly do. Oh, thank you. I'm still yeah. working on it. It's a work in progress. <laughs> but, but life is really, yeah, so, yes. you know, <laughs> we're always perfecting. If, mm -hmm. yeah, if we wait for the perfect opportunity and the perfect time and the perfect product, none of us would be doing anything. Exactly. So you have, your brand is the versatile musician mm -hmm. and I'm very intrigued by it. I actually went and bought, I've been working using with the, a terrible keyboard the last couple of months because I don't do a lot of teaching from home and most of my teaching is in institutions where there is a piano already right and when my piano died i didn't bother replacing it but i've actually gone and bought another piano because i want to go back and revisit the piano i use backing tracks mm -hmm. you know i'll own that many of us in ccm we use backing tracks um because we're all so busy and it's time consuming to learn to do anything else Mm -hmm. So what is unique about your program and what is it about your program that can fast track our learning to what we need to know? 
So the, the way this all started is that I started, as I got more involved in vocal pedagogy, I had so many singer friends and people I was meeting at conferences who were coming up to me going, okay, I saw you play the piano. I'm really embarrassed about my piano skills. Can I study with you? And I had at one point, like 10 singers that were studying with me all kind of in secret because they didn't want to announce to everybody that they didn't. And, you know, I had never, I was a pianist first, so I didn't really understand what the problem was because I hadn't seen it. And I realized that so many of them were going through the same thing. They had had class piano in college. It was mm-hmm. totally useless. They didn't yes. learn the things they needed to yes. use. And I did and classical so, piano. Right. Totally and, and so those things aren't, aren't necessarily, those skills aren't, aren't helpful. And if you've only got two semesters or four semesters of it, you know, what are you going to do? And so I started to, to really see where the, where the problem was that a lot of these piano courses were created by pianists Mm -hmm. who don't understand the skills that singers need. So after teaching like dozens and dozens of people, I thought, I wonder if I could make an online course that would teach what I teach in the first 12 lessons and then offer it to people so that they could buy it. And so I created my first online course called Piano Skills for Singers. And I just kind of figured it out. I'd never used video. I'd never edited. I'd never done anything like that. And I had like several hundred people sign up for it. And I couldn't, wow. I couldn't believe it. And then people were like, you got to do a level two. And I was like, okay. So I made level two, you know, it was hmm. like huge. It had, you know, dozens of videos in it. And then people were like, what about a jazz class? And so before I knew it, I had seven full courses. And, um, I had all these students and all this stuff was going on. You know, I have, I had like a solfege class, several classes in solfege, all of the skills that are helping primarily singers, but also pianists and general music teachers to get the broad range of skills. So this past summer, I decided that I was going to take all of this material and put it in one place. And so that's where it became the versatile musician. And so the the concept here is that it's a a single place where you can go to kind of self-educate or educate um, in whatever it is that you need. Mm -hmm. So if you are a jazz singer, you can do the piano, the couple of basic piano skills courses, and then you can go right into the jazz one. And if you're somebody who is embarrassed because you have some issues with your rhythm, you can go in and go through all of that. And then I subsequently have been putting up tons and tons of videos. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I have like 150 videos up there. So I took all of those. I've noticed. I've got a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> yes, and so you I do. took all of those, I re-edited them and I made printables for all of them and put all of that up on the membership. And so now I have members in there who are saying to me, you know, I can direct them in, into what they need. So someone comes in and they say, I can do this, this, and this, I need to do this, this, and this. And I give them a prescription saying, do this, do this much, then do this. And then, you know, come back to me when you finish those. And so it, it's been really great. And of course the members are also saying, so I did this, but I also need this. And so when they tell me what they need, I can make that for the members. So it's a real, it's a real customized environment, um, of whoever comes in. So there's 380 videos up there. Wow. Unique videos. And I think I'm at 550 pages of course printables. It's a lot. That's a lot of work and a lot of effort and time gone into that. Okay. And I'm I'm in touch with, you know, people email me, they have questions like, you know, it's, it's a really interactive environment. So we're going to use me as a case study. Yes. All right. So I can be your case study. So I learned classical piano and I know other piano teachers who are brilliant classical pianists and can't accompany. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can you hear that? I can hear it a little bit, but it's not that loud. Okay. Danny, that was a cut for you there. Okay. (laughs) So let's use me as your case study, Mm -hmm. right? I can play any chord. If you ask me to play a chord, I can play it in root position and I can go doing, doing on beat. I don't know what to do with this hand, Mm -hmm. but so I can do that in a root position and I would love to be able to just accompany. I don't want to, I, I can read notes. I can note bash if I have to, it takes me a little bit of time. Um, 
So do you have a program then for teachers like me, CCM teachers, because I know a lot of the songs are written, they're basically three or four chord mm -hmm. structures. So do you have a program that will teach us how to move around in yes. different inversions to move around a lot quicker Absolutely. and also what to do with this hand at the same time? Yes. So some of that is covered in piano skills for singers level two, level two, I call it the singer's toolkit because it teaches how to play every chord quality, um, three and four note chord qualities. It teaches you how to play all of the basic voice exercises in 12 keys. So it's really the place where people can get all that stuff so they could sit down. And then I think it's section four or section five. I take through, take, you know, people through, um, I think seven accompaniment strategies. So if, if you have, uh, a, a, you know, a, an old fashioned music theater song, this is something you can play. If it's a waltz, you can play this. Um, if it's a rock song, you can play this or this, if it's, you know, so that's one great place to start. Cool. Um, the jazz piano course has a lot of like accompaniment strategies for like walking bass lines and bossa mm -hmm. nova, if that's where yeah. you're going. And then the newest thing that I'm doing, I just had a live workshop, which is now filmed and up on the site called the crash course in pop piano accompaniment. And that I'm sounds running, like me. It's, it was really, really cool because this is again, the next frontier. And so what I do is I teach all of the pop major pop chord, you know, uh, strategies. And then I have, I think it's seven or eight different rhythm strategies between the two hands. Um, and then I show how to build an arrangement. Like, what do you do with all of this information to build an arrangement? So if I'm playing clocks by cold play, how can I, how, what's the bare minimum I can play so that people are satisfied? Yes. So that's, that's really, you know, I'm running it again, live in January, that course, but it already lives on the site for members. So whenever I do a workshop, the members get access to all of that for free and they get first dibs to the videos and all the print resources. So, um, you know, I've also just finished filming a batch of how to play songs. So I'm doing a cross section of a whole bunch, uh, probably by the end of January, there will be a dozen or more of them up there of like, how do you play this style of song? How do you play this style of song? What do you play for this? And so again, as the members are telling me what they're playing, there's one fellow, an Australian guy who's playing in a classic rock band. And okay. so like, I kind of need to know. So I'm now making a bunch of how do you play this style of old song and how do you, you know, yes. so that, that's really where I get into that. And then a lot of times what shows up with people is that there are rhythm issues or that they need to really work out once they get to a certain place, they need to really dig into that. There's a whole course on rhythm. And I have a ton of one-off tutorials that are just addressing things, how to play a song by ear, how to count the jazz band in, how to practice your chords in 12 keys in four different ways. It's like tons and tons and tons oh of my stuff gosh. There that you can go. And That's you can a lot. Choose, you can pick and choose what you want. So you could say, I want something different to practice. I have a whole course just called piano improvisation for everyone where if you want to just get a little bit more mobility on the piano, it's a whole course just of easy improv exercise. Mm -hmm. So if people join your program, they have access to everything or do you everything. have different tiers? Of no, I have one tier. It's, it's you're in, it's two tiers. You're in or you're out. <laughs> okay. I don't want to be on the out. <laughs> if you're in, you get, you get everything. And there's a monthly zoom call where I get on the phone and I either give a workshop or people ask questions. Um, and we do like a kind of a practice thing and every month there's a theme. So, um, January is going to be like getting back to practicing. So how to establish those kinds of routines. And, you know, as I said, people will shoot me an email and say, I'm stuck on something. And I'm usually responding within 24 hours. Cause mm. you know, there's not 10,000 people in there. It's like a, a relatively reasonable size group. So yes. Yes. Um, Cause I wanted to do that one that you just did, but due to the time sometimes the time difference can be so tricky for us in australia and we have to rely on on replays to mm -hmm. to ac access any of the the tutorials or things that are going on it's a bit sad our time zone here um we feel like we're in a different planet 
<laughs> doesn't even feel like we're in the same world. That is so cool. And we're going to share all your links in our show notes. If people oh, want yay. to find out anything about your training program with the versatile musician, mm -hmm. I absolutely 100% endorse what you're doing i've seen bits and pieces of it as i said i follow you on social um, on insta there's a lot of information that you put out even on instagram mm -hmm. and it's all so brilliant and you do a great job of it and Thank you. you are an inspiration to everyone because i know for a fact that you've learned to do all of this yourself you mm -hmm. don't have anyone helping you with any of your your tech requirements your social media any of that you are just doing this all on your own and and mm -hmm. it's a credit to you we can Thank all you. we can all aspire to do what you're doing i don't enjoy social media i do it <laughs> because i have to and right. but i do have someone help me with that be and even with the YouTube stuff, I've never looked at one YouTube video because I, I think I couldn't bear looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> and all my, all my little idiosyncrasies. Um, so in wrapping this up, your biggest projects I think you've shared with us, is there, are there any other projects you're working on right now? No, I mean, the, the biggest thing is that I'm, I'm trying to get, I'm, I'm trying to get the word out about the membership. I am constantly working on improving my communication about it. Um, you should see the list of videos that I have planned for this year. It is like bonkers, but okay. that's part of, part of what, what really inspired me to do it was not that I could be necessarily just be of service to other people, but I have so much material that I've gathered over the years and I've developed from all these random things that I've done that I wanted to really document all of it and make it available to people. Cause in the yes. same way, you know, you just, you just said like, Oh, you, you know, you figured all this stuff out. It's like, well, I, I self studied all of this stuff by using YouTube videos and, you know, I took some online courses and different things. And so I really believe that this is a very viable way. You do not have to go to college or take an expensive program. Mm -hmm there's a lot of things that you can really do on your own, um, in a kind of DIY way. And this is meant to be that kind of resource. Yes. So you're kind of bridging the gap because there are a lot of piano teachers, uh, people, pianists who have high level classical training that can't accompany. Right. Or can't, or have a student that comes in and is in their, like their worship band at their church or gets in the jazz band and they can't retain students mm -hmm. or, or somebody who wants to write songs. And so this is really, that's why I'm saying it's the versatile musician. The idea is the more tricks that you have in your toolbox, um, the more you'll be able to attract and retain students and also be available for gigs that you know, other people are, are, are getting and you're not because there's certain gaps in, in your capacity. So, yes, you know, yes. Last question. So what is the one piece of advice that you would, you would offer to our singing voice community based on all your experiences, your knowledge? What's the one thing you would like to share with us? I would say it would be to stay open to what the possibilities could be because I think for anyone who has had a long career, I mean, you know, who obviously Adina Menzel might look at that differently because she's just a Broadway star all the way through, but then there's the rest of us who we change, we grow, we more, mm -hmm. we get interested in other things. We mm -hmm. take detours, we have babies and take breaks. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's like really being open to a, a, a range of options and not being so stuck into saying, but I'm just a jazz singer or all I do is music theater or I'm only in a rock band. It, it's like, I think that that is the place where a lot of people get hung up. And so I think keeping yourself open to the idea that you, you, there's a lot of things out there that you could be doing is probably my best advice. I love that. And basically that's been my, my life. Mm -hmm. that, that's how I've sustained a career over 45 years mm -hmm. is to do exactly that is to keep evolving, reinventing. That's what you have to do if you want to stay in this industry. You know, Absolutely. you may, you may start out 
for me, I started out as a singer first. Now I teach in a university program. Now I have a podcast and Mm -hmm. there's a book coming out. I mean, you have to keep evolving and growing. And through all those experiences, it does make you a better professional too. And it's fun. You know, the the biggest, the biggest part of it for me is that you know, if all I was doing for the rest of my life was, was playing in a jazz club, I mean, it doesn't sound terrible, but no, I would have missed out on some of the most fun that I've ever had playing mm-hmm. music. And so for yes. me, it's staying in the process, thinking of being a process oriented person and staying in the process has been the thing that has made me excited to hop out of bed every morning. You know, yes. even if it's, I'm doing social media posts today, it's like having the, the excitement of like, I'm making something, I'm doing something, hopefully I'm reaching someone, hopefully this is going to, mm-hmm. you know, change someone or help mm-hmm. them in some way. It's like, that's what, that's what is fun, you know? Yes. And the people you meet along the way. Oh yes. Absolutely. Like our friend, Ruben. I know <laughs> Ruben Bradley. We have to say his name on the podcast. Hey, Ruben. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Who we I met do. on a cruise ship, you know, of all places. Yes. And I met at work. We actually teach at the same two institutions. Right. Right. How weird. And Brenda, we have to do one more thing before we say goodbye to our listeners. We both have to stand up and show what's on the bottom. (laughs) What we're both wearing. We have to do this. Okay. On the count of three. Okay. You get ready. One, two, three. (laughs) Shorts. I'm, I'm like all dressy on the top, but I am wearing mm-hmm. my pajamas on the bottom. <laughs> and I'm wearing my shorts and bare feet on the bottom. <laughs> Very different w- weather, obviously. But exactly. Brenda, we're going to wrap it up here. And you have been amazing and beautiful and kind and generous with your time. And I really appreciate you and the work that you're doing. Please keep it up. We need Brenda right oh, thank now thank you so we much i feel the same you. way about you thank you and i'll look forward to taking some of those online piano tutorials and i'm going to show everybody what i've learned i'll do it before and after this yes, is me it. now and this is what i can do now <laughs> <laughs> brenda wishing you all the very best in 2022 with all your ventures and I'm sure we're going to catch up very soon. Take care. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye.